Uh, today's topic is the Lord's Passover versus Easter Sunday. Okay. So the topic is the Lord's Passover versus Easter Sunday. Okay. Bring it out. All right. All right. Let's start off at uh, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Let's go there first. 2 Corinthians. Bishop say Corinthians. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Start at verse 1. Let's read that. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. Read. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Come on. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. All right. So the Most High God said he's a jealous God. All right. He's the only God of Israel. First and foremost, he's the one true God. And he says, we are espoused unto Jesus Christ. All right, read on. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. To so he says, as the serpent beguiled Eve. What, Eve, what does it mean to beguile? B-E-G-U-I-L-E. -E. What does that mean? Um, Shemuel. Let me hear Shemuel. What does it mean to beguile? Um, shalom, leadership. Shalom. Beguile would mean to trick. Or deceive. Very good. All right. Begal means to trick or deceive. Very good. Verse 3 again. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. All right. So serving Christ is what? You're saying it's, it's simplicity. The scripture says, keep my commandments and what? Yeah. All right. You break his, the way to the sin is what? Yeah. All right. So he feared. <laughs> uh let's go to galatians real quick i just thought about this scripture brother's funny uh go to galatians read chapter 2 verse 21 and then read 3 and 1 watch this real quick the book of galatians chapter 2 verse 21 come on i do not frustrate the grace of god so paul saying he does not frustrate the grace of god remember when Paul was on the scene, what were they saying about Paul? Who knows? When Paul was teaching, what were they saying about Paul? They were saying that Paul came with a new doctrine. Outside. There you go. Stop. Very good. That's it. They were saying Paul was teaching against the law of Moses. All right. Acts was at 15. Okay. All right. So read that again. And then read, um, what's that? Uh, chapter 3 and 1. Galatians chapter 2 verse 21. Come on. I do not frustrate the grace of God. So he's saying, I'm not teaching anything different, okay? I'm not teaching you to break God's commandments. I'm not doing that, read. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Read. Foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth? You see that? He says, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? So I want y'all to think back during that time. All right. What was going on during this time? Where is uh, Galatia? Galatia. That is located. That's what you see. That's called Asia Minor. OK. Uh, Jerusalem is on the coastline. You see Syria. It's south of Syria. OK. So I want you to read it again. Read chapter three, verse one. Galatians chapter three, verse one. Come on. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That ye should not obey the truth. So when you really think about it, brothers and sisters, is it that far-fetched that Israelites could be living in Galatia? I mean, it's right there. Jerusalem is right below Syria. All right? So it says, O foolish Galatians, who has deceived you that you should not obey the truth? Okay, come on. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently sent forth crucified among you all right he said this is obvious all right don't don't be beguiled in the simplicity in christ he's saying it saying the same thing but just differently okay now go to colossians 2 and 8 real quick go to colossians 2 8 so why are we going through these precepts all right remember today's topic is the lord's passover versus easter sunday okay what you'll realize the same things that we face today in America is the same things that were going on back during our time, during the time of Paul and the apostles. All right. Even the time of Christ. All right. 
Read what you got. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Come on. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So when it says spoil, what are two words that we just went over? What are two words that are synonymous to to um spoil? We just went over them. Uh, Brother Yeshaya. Beguile. And? Deceive. Or that. You said beguile. Uh, okay, one second. Give you another shot. He's looking. He's looking at it. So you said beguile was the first one. What was the second? Uh, bewitch. Bewitch. Very good. Very good. All right, so now he says spoil. Let's read it again. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Through what? Through philosophy. What is what does that mean to philosophize or through philosophy? What does that mean? Who can give me an example? Um, and tell us. Um, shalom, leadership. Shalom. Um, philosophy is like um, trying to give an understanding of a particular subject or a. Can y'all hear him? Speaking to the mic like this. Uh, right? Okay, trying to give a um, a like a uh, um, directions or a teaching on like a specific subject. Yes. Somebody got anything to add to that, uh, brother? Right here. Shalom, leadership. Shalom. Uh, philosophy is just trying to use um, uh, a reason to explain away things that the Most High is doing. So, uh, like science, almost. Yes. Um, so. You said, I like what you said, you said explain away. So is it actually backed up with something or is it just... It's, not, it's, not, it's hypotheses and all that stuff. It's not backed up with anything. Exactly. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's read that again. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. Come on. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And vain deceit. Y'all know what deceit means. It means to deceive. Okay. Read on. After the tradition of men. All right, so this is very key for today's class. It says, after the tradition of men, and what? After the rudiments of the world, uh -huh. and not after Christ. And not after who? Not after Christ. Remember, Paul said this in three separate occasions. The same thing, meaning what? There was going to come a day when this would actually happen, okay? Okay. But the thing about it, it was happening during his time as well. That's why he said it like that to the Galatians, okay? Now, we're going to tie all of this together. But first, we're going to deal with the Lord's Passover. That's very important. Uh, coming up this Thursday at sundown, okay? So we're going to go over that really quick. And then we're going to get into the second part of the class. So let's start in the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter. All right, read some of our great history. All right, the great deliverance that the Most High God did for our people. All right, give me that. Exodus chapter 12, start at the first verse. The book of Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Come on. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. The what? The beginning of months. All right. Who knows what the first month of the year is called and who has the precept? Uh, and tell us. Um, the first month of the year is called a bib and is uh, Deuteronomy 16 and 1. Very good. Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 1. So if you don't have it, all you got to do, take your pen, write Deuteronomy 16 and 1, write by Exodus 12 and 2. Now you got it. All right, read what you got. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 1. Come on. Observe the month of a bib. The what? The month of a bib. Read on. And keep the Passover. And do what? Keep the Passover. Come on. Unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. All right. So let me ask you. I want to make sure you're following along and truly understand. Did it just say that the month of Abib was the first month? Because I didn't hear it. Did it say that in that verse that is the first month? So how do you know? Brother Jeremiah. Just got to make sure they pay attention. Shalom, leadership. Shalom. Uh, it said because to keep the Passover, and he told us to keep the Passover the first month. There you go. Where do you, where do you say that at? Um, in Exodus 12. In Exodus 12. Very good. Let's go back to Exodus 12 and 2. 
The book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 2. Come on. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Oh, yeah. Who knows what a bid means? Uh, Brother Jeremiah again. A bib means ear of corn. Ear of corn. So could you give people an understanding real quick, Jeremiah? When it, if a bib means ear of corn, what is that signifying? What is that going into? Um, during the wintertime, everything dies. So ear of corn means everything is coming back to life. That's correct. Very good. Very good. So let's go back to Exodus 12. Pick up at 3. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Come on. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. A what? A lamb. A chicken. A lamb. A turkey. A lamb. I'm just making sure. Read on. Take to every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers. A lamb for an house. So, I'm going to stop you right there. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. If you didn't want to eat lamb, what could you eat for the Passover? Before we get into it. If you didn't want to eat lamb, because there's a doctrine out there saying... That you can eat chicken or steak, whatever you want, because Christ is the Passover. It's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. But remember, it said, let no man deceive you, right? Right. So now we're going to deal with what the Bible says. There is an alternative. So if you don't want to eat lamb for the Passover, what can you eat? Okay, everybody said it. Very good. The call out, brothers. All praises. But that's correct. Now, the thing that takes it a step above, where's that scripture at? Since they want to call out. Where's the scripture at? Shalom, leadership. Shalom. Uh, the book of Exodus chapter 12 and verse 5. Let's find out. See that? The book of Exodus chapter 12 verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Or from the goats. Very good, Simon. Read verse 4 and 5. Verse 4. Come on. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your shall make your account for the lamb. So it's just saying, make sure you have enough for everybody. That's what it's saying right there. All right, read on. Your lamb shall be without blemish, uh -huh. a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Read on. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day. Until the what? Until the fourteenth day. Come on. Of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. At what time? In the evening. Come on. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. All right. So at this time, what, who can give us an explanation of why our forefathers put the blood on the doorposts? Who knows why? Mm, okay, let me see some more hands. Make sure you know. Uh, Brother Tony, there he is. Let's hear from Tony. Why did our forefathers do that? There you go. So the first of their, uh, of their family would be killed um, because of the punishment to uh, to the um, to Pharaoh. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. The uh, the Egyptians. All right. So that's that death spirit could do what? Pass over. Pass over. Very good. All right. Let's read on. Verse seven. Do I we do we do that still, brothers? Do we do that still? All right. Very good. Come on. Verse seven. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire. So my question is, what are the other um, cooking methods that you can make the uh, Passover lamb? Because it says roast right here. What are the other methods you can use? There's only one way to cook it. It's going to tell you right here. We just got to keep reading. All right, read that verse again. Exodus chapter 12, verse 8. Come on. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Roast with fire. So the only way to do it is putting that bad boy on the grill. Cook it over fire. Open heat. Not an oven. Can't do an oven. <sighs> can't, you can't boil it. It's going to tell you you can't boil it. Just for you, Shemuel. Read on. Roast with fire and unleavened bread. Come on. And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Did it say with mashed potatoes? 
What did it say? And with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. With some green beans. With bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So what's the Passover meal, brothers? What is it? You can say it. And wait, wait, hold on. Say it again. So say it. Again. Yes, and wine, and wine. That's Samson's son right there. That's Samson's son. All right, read, read that again. Exodus chapter twelve, verse eight. Come on. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Come on. Eat not of it raw, nor soldered. At all with water. You hear that, Shimmy? Well, no boiling of the lamb, and you can't eat no rice. No rice. This ain't Douglas. All right. Read on. But roast with fire. But do what? Roast with fire. Come on. His head with his legs. Read. And with the prutenance thereof. Verse ten. Come on. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. Come on. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Read. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hands. And ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Passover. All right. So, Mordecai asked me this like about four years ago. I remember, brother. I be remembering stuff, bro. He asked me. He said... He said, officer, um, do we still have to eat the Passover with our staffs in our hands? I was like, no. All right, so who knows what that's going into? Uh, Brother Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Shalom. Uh, it was saying uh, that they had to eat it in haste because they had to uh, get up and leave. Right, right, right. They had to leave where? Egypt. Very good. He was thinking. He was thinking, where are they leaving? Where the, dang, where were they, where were they was at? All right, read on. Verse 12. Come on. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. All the gods of Egypt. I want y'all to think about that. Hey, this class is going to have layers to it. So remember what we just heard, the gods of Egypt. All right, we're going to get into that a little bit. Laid in the class. All right, keep going. And against all the gods of Egypt, Read. I will execute judgment. He will do what? I will execute judgment. Come on. I am the Lord. Read. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. Uh huh. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Read. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. How long? Throughout your generations. So it says we shall keep this feast. And what consists in this feast? What items? What do we eat on this feast? Who? What do we, we eat? Lamb? Herbs? Wine? Unleavened bread. Read verse 14 again. Verse 14. Come on. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generation. So it's saying we shall keep this day till this day. You understand? That's what we should do. We're going to keep it forever and ever until Christ come. All right? It's not going to change. Okay? Uh. 15. No, no, no. Finish that off. I'm sorry. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. So one of the questions was, um, should we remove like cleaning supplies that have leaven in it? That's not what the scripture is talking about. Read it again. Verse 15. Come on. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Uh huh. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. So what is it going into, brothers? Yes, food. Yes. So yes, that's what it's going into. So it says you must have that removed. Uh, shimmy well. All right, go ahead. Microphone. Uh, you made a statement. You said that we're going to keep the Passover to Christ come back. Uh, won't we still be keeping it when we come back, according to scripture? 
And we I mean, we're not going to stop. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll confuse you. We're not going to. I'm just. We're not going to stop keeping it. Is that better? Yes, sir. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry to confuse you. All right. Uh, read that again. Read verse 15 again. Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Come on. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. 16. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. Now, I have a question for you. What's the difference between Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread? What's the difference? Uh, Jeremiah. Shalom. Um, Passover is just where we kill the lamb and eat the lamb because the Lord is going to send the death angel. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread is where we actually have to eat the unleavened bread for seven days after the Passover. Okay. Anybody else? Tony? He right here, right here. You, only one person gets to eat all the food on the plate. So, no leftovers. So, the difference between... Say that again. The difference. What's the difference between Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread? What's the difference? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, you can have some leftovers. You can have some leftover on one and the other one, the man got to eat all of it. You know what? That is right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Very good. Heck, yes. That's good. Clap, clap for him. That was good. That's right. He is 100% correct. Shalom, Captain. Um, so, Luke 22 and 1. Let's go. Luke 22 and 1. Very good. Very good. All right, so make sure if you didn't have it, write it down in your Bibles. All right, read that. Luke chapter 22, verse 1. The book of Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Come on. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. See that? It says that the feast of unleavened bread is called the Passover. Now, let's go back to Exodus, the 12th chapter. Now, I want y'all to tell me which verse, which verse did we read that singled out? Listen to how I'm saying. Which verse did we read that singled out the quote-unquote Passover? We read it in, it says Exodus 12, but which verse just singles it out? 12 and 16. Yes. Why? Why? Yes. Because in the first day, that should be a holy convocation. That's it. That's it. That is the Passover. The first day. The holy convocation, we come together, that's the Passover. And then the continuation is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right? Just want to make sure y'all all see that. I know there's a lot of people first time. So now, you got it. You should have it. Write it down. So in the Lord's will next year. Oh, that's easy. I got that. All right? So, let's... Let's read 16 and 17, then we'll go somewhere else. Exodus chapter 12, verse 16. Come on. And in the first day, there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be an holy convocation to you. Uh -huh. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day, have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Forever. So if anybody tries to switch that, that's dangerous. That's why the, uh, the scripture tells us, don't let nobody bewitch you, beguile you, or deceive you, or spoil you. All right? If you try to change that, because it said forever. All right? I hope y'all understand that thing. All right, now from there, let's drop that. Let's Come go real to quick, Cap. On the, can I touch on verse on the 15? Go ahead. Hey, read 15 real quick. Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. All right, stop. I want to touch on that and make sure the on the first timers is clear. All right, don't check your toasters and everything for right, breadcrumbs. Right, right. All right, don't check your microwaves. Don't clean your microwaves, your ovens out. And your car, your car seats uh, for babies who be eating 
um, cookies and stuff like that. All right, and 11 is all around us. All right, and so make sure you're cleaning out your cupboards and everything like that, okay? All right, oh, read it all the way through real quick. We'll finish. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that, sh that soul shall be cut off from Israel. All right, what you got? Shalom. Shalom. Which day shall we not work on? The, the convocation. Thank you for asking that. Uh, very, very good. Um, go to Leviticus 23. Very good. Very good. The book of Leviticus, chapter 23, verse 5. Come on. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Mm -hmm. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Right. So that's uh, another, another example of the difference between the two all right read seven days ye must eat unleavened bread and the first day ye shall have an holy convocation ye shall do no servile work therein you see so the first day you shouldn't do any work that's your precept right there all right uh read on but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the lord Come seven on. days and the seventh day is an holy convocation ye shall do no servile work therein in the what? In the seventh day is so, it so that's the what would be what's another name for that? In the seventh day of this feast. What's another name? You can call out. The last day or the closing. All right. Read that verse again. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. Come on. And the seventh day is an holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. Right. So on the opening day and on the last day. It's a Sabbath, all right? No work, all right? No buying or selling. Yes. Microphone, please. I just have a question because I thought it was the, the, the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. I thought that was a total of eight days. So, so let's, let's go through it real quick. Give me verse five again. I'll explain it like this. Yeah. All right. So, it says, in the 14th day of the first month at even. So, that would be what? That would be the 14th day at even, which begins what? The which day? The 15th day. You see? Then you count seven days. Okay. So if, you don't, if you don't understand, if you, nobody ever understands, don't be scared to ask a question. But that's how you would count it. Okay? All right. Everybody good? Everybody understand that? Okay. Very good. Um, let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6. All right. So we understand in the new covenant, our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ uh, was sacrificed for us. Give me that in John 1 29 first. All right. Before we read this. The book of John chapter 1 verse 29. As, as a matter of fact, so sorry. We're going to take this route. I just have to, we got to kill that, that, uh, that stupid doctrine that's out there real quick. Give me Mark 14 and 12 real quick. All right. Mark 14 and 12. The book of Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Uh-huh. And the first day of unleavened bread, when they killed the Passover, his disciples said unto him, where wilt thou that we go and prepare that thou mayest eat the Passover? And he sendeth forth two of his disciples and said unto them, Go ye into the city, and there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Come on. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, The master saith, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Come on. And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us. Uh-huh. And his disciples went forth and came into the city and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Read. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, one of you which eateth with me. Wait, wait, one of you that what? One of you which eateth with me. That does what? 
one of you which eateth with me. Stop. Give me that in Peter's chapter 2, verse 21. Who knows what Christ was eating? What was he eating? What else? What else? And thank you. Okay. Read this. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Come on. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. He left us a what? An example. Uh, who knows what an example is? Anybody know? Brother Simon? Uh, when you model, when you model something um, that you want somebody to follow. Yes, yes. Well, when you do something that you want people to model after you, yes. all right, that you want them to follow. An example is for following. Okay, Christ left us what example? He ate the Passover meal, so we should do what? We should do the same thing. Okay. All right. So that's that's kill. That's easy. Moving on. All right. Let's go to First Corinthians five six. 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. These doctrines are getting weaker and weaker. All right. 1 Corinthians 5 and 6. The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 6. Come on. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So, it says, don't you know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? All right. Who, whoever made yeast rolls or anything like that? Okay. No, we ain't got no cookies in here. You made some yeast rolls, bro? I made some. How'd they turn out, though? That's the question. I tried myself. It didn't turn out good. It was but, bad. yes, most, sister, y'all made some yeast rolls? I know, yeah, sister, I know sister uh, made some yeast rolls before. But if you put yeast in it, what's going to happen? It's going to rise, all right? So read it again. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So, in the new covenant, what is this being symbolic of? Who knows? You should know this. Uh, Brother Arie. Sin. Sin, exactly. So if you have sin amongst you, just a little bit of it is going to do what? It's going to grow into more. Yes. What? There you go. You in the, bro, you in, my, you in the spirit, bro. Like doth a canker. All right? I ain't going to go to the scripture, but that's right. If you got sin amongst you and you don't check it, it's going to spread and start affecting everybody. Okay? Let's read on. Verse 7. Come on. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, even, our, who? even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. What did John call Christ back in uh, John 1 and 29? What did he call him? He called him what? The what? The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. That's what John referred to Christ as. Very good. Read this verse again. Verse 7. Come on. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump. Uh-huh. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Read. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. So, we got... To realize that when we're cleaning out our house, our houses, excuse me, what else should we be cleaning up? Our what? Ourselves, our spirits. All right. We can't go into uh, the new year. Well, I'll, I'll say Passover. All right. Can't go into the Passover with the same baggage. Okay. We got to check ourselves. We should be changed. We should, another chance at repentance. Okay. Read on. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice uh -huh. and wickedness, Read, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right. I want you to read verse 9. I'm going to make a quick point and move on. Verse 9. Come on. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So what you'll see a lot of times, if brothers and sisters are removed from the body, they're probably, depending on when it happens, I'll say this, depending on when it happens, let's say if it's a month or two before Passover, most likely... They won't be brought back until late after the Passover because we're not going to go into the feast with that what? With that sin in the body. You understand that, right? Yes, sir. Okay, I want to make sure you understand that thing. Now, give me Ezra 6 and 19. Okay? All right, after this, we're going to get uh, deeper into the class. All right, give me Ezra chapter 6, verse 19. The book of Ezra chapter 6, verse 19. Come on. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover. The children of what? 
the children of the captivity. Let me ask y'all, are we uh, in our homeland right now? So what will we be called in America? The children of captivity. Read it again. And the children of the captivity. Come on. Kept the Passover. They did what? Kept the Passover. Because there's another doctrine saying because there's no temple, we can't keep the laws. There's another doctrine out there saying the same thing. Do we need a temple anymore? What was the temple for? Right. Thank you. So do we sacrifice anymore, men? No, we don't. So we don't need a temple. Where's the temple now? Who has a precept? Where's the t uh, Hezekiah? Give him the mic, please. Where is the temple now? First Corinthians th uh, three sixteen. This is the book of First Corinthians, chapter three, verse sixteen. Come on. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That's very good. Very very good. You're 100% you're correct, but I do want to read this precept. I thought it said something else. You're right, 100%. Acts 7.48. Watch this. Going into the statement I made before. The book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 48. Come on. How be it, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. All right, so for the brother or the sister who says we can't keep the Passover, I mean, I don't know what to tell you after that verse right there. It says the Most High God don't dwell in temples no more. Meaning what? We don't need a temple to keep God's high holy days. Okay? Go back to Ezra. Finish that off. Then we about to jump into it. The book of Ezra chapter 6 verse 19. Come on. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. So, now, remember today's topic was titled what? The Lord's Passover verse Easter Sunday. Now, you see how we were able to go into the Bible and go scripture for scripture when it came to what? Passover, right? Give me the book of Acts 17 and 10 real quick. Acts 17 and 10. The book of Acts chapter 17 verse 10. Come on. You could do the same thing for Easter, but our people don't know how to do it properly. Okay, I can say that. I'm. We're going to go into the Bible. I'm going to show you Easter in the Bible, but it's not what the Christian church says it is, okay? Read this. The book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 10. Come on. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Read on. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Uh-huh. In that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And search the scriptures daily. And did what? Search the scriptures daily. Why? Whether those things were so. So by searching the scriptures daily, they were able to do what? They were able to discern what's real and what's not real. Okay? Verse 12. Come on. Verse 12. Uh-huh. Therefore, many of them believed. Many of them believed. Read. Also, of honorable women. Of honorable women. Come on. Which were Greeks. And of men, not a few. All right. So we have brothers and sisters who were scattered that did believe in Paul's message. Okay. Now, from there, give me the book of Acts. We're going to start here. Acts chapter 19. All right. So we're going to bring up some books. So now we're going into uh, Easter Sunday. We're going into Easter Sunday. This first book is titled, The Two Babylons or the Papal Worship Proved to Be the Worship of Nimrod and His Wife by alexander hislop all right it's got uh a lot of good things in it okay all right so i'm gonna start off at page i wrote it down 109 okay i'm gonna start off at page 109 i'm gonna read an excerpt then i want you to read this scripture all right all right so this is page 109 this is the mid paragraph it says an egg of wondrous size is said to have fallen from heaven into the euphrates the fishes rolled it to the bank where the doves, having settled upon it and hatched it, out came Venus, who afterwards was called the Syrian goddess that is Astarte. Hence, the egg became one of the symbols of Astarte or Easter. And accordingly, in Cyprus, one of the chosen seats of the worship of Venus or Astarte, the egg of wondrous size 
was represented on a grand scale. Now, I'm going to jump back really quick. We're going to go to page... We're going to go to page 100. Watch this. This is the two Babylons. This is page 100. So make sure you write, these, write this down, all right? You can go back and refer to it later. Now, we said Venus, Easter, and Astarte, right? So we have to match... The, the actual names up with the Bible. Okay, watch this. Page 100. Therefore, Diana, who though commonly represented in popular myths only as the huntress Diana, was in reality the great mother of gods, has frequently the boar's head as her, accompany, as her accompaniment because her son Tammuz, the folklore or the myth was that her son Tammuz, which is also her husband, was killed by a boar. Okay, that's why it re uh, references the boar head. All right. It says, I'll pick up here. The great mother of gods has frequently the boar's head as her accompaniment. In token, not of any mere success in the chase, but of her triumph over the grand enemy of the idolatrous system. Now pay attention to this portion. In which she occupied so conspicuous a place According to Theocritus, Venus was reconciled to the boar that killed Adonis. The Greek name for Tammuz was Adonis. Who caught what was just said? Diana was also called what? What? Say it in the mic, please. Somebody give him a mic. Another name for Diana was what? Venus. 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 Who remembers what we just read about Venus? What was her tale? Y'all need me to read it again? Oh, let me hear you say it. What was her tale? Or her myth? Um, that an egg fell into the Euphrates. From where? From space. Yeah, yeah, from up there, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Go to Acts. Go to Acts chapter 19. Uh, what I call? What I say? 35. Read verse 35. Watch this. Watch this. So, so what are we proving? Easter in the Bible. Okay. All right. Read what you got. Acts chapter 19, verse 35. Come on. Start at verse 34. Verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, great is Diana. Great is who? Great is Diana. Diana is also known as who? Venus. All right. Read. Great is Diana. Of the Ephesians. Come on. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana? Uh-huh. And of the image which fell down from Jupiter. And the what? The image which fell down from Jupiter. Where did we just read that? We just read that in the book. The Im what was that image? The egg. Page 108, the bottom half. And I'm going to carry over to uh, the top paragraph of 109. Listen close. It says, the origin of the Pash eggs is just as clear. The ancient Druids bore an egg as the sacred emblem of their order. And the sacred festivals, even as in this country. In ancient times, eggs were used in religious rites of the Egyptians and and the Greeks, and were hung up for mystic purposes in their temples. So it says these eggs were hung up in these temples. All right, let's read the Bible. Acts chapter 19, 22 verse, uh, through 24. Watch this. Come on. Acts chapter 19, verse 22. Uh -huh. so, he sent into Mord so he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Thamosius and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Read. And the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Uh -huh. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana. Which did what? Made silver shrines for Diana. Uh huh. Brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. What does that mean? We I read this for a reason. So what is that talking about? Demetrius said he made small shrines. Who can paint the picture? Who can explain it for the people? Right. All right, read it out loud for us. 
Shrine. Definition of shrine. A case, box, or receptacle. Especially one in which sacred relics, such as the bones of a saint, are deposited. A place in which devotion is paid to a saint or deity. All right. Very good. So in this situation, what was the emblem or the symbol of Diana? The egg. All right. Remember what it said. They would hang those up where? In their temples. They actually had priest of Diana or a star or a star or Venus or all of these other names that we're about to go into today. All right. So from there, let's go to the book of same book. Verse 27. Acts chapter 19, verse 27. Come on. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught. So what's going on right here? He's upset because he did this by trade. He made these idols by trade. All right. And the apostles were doing what? They were speaking against it. All right. Watch what he says in verse 27. Come on. Verse 27. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised uh -huh. and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. You see that? It says whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. So it means everybody on the face of the earth was worshiping this goddess. Now, the only thing that a lot of our people today don't realize is that the whole world's doing it again. Okay, but they've been doing it all the way since the time of Nimrod's Babylon. Okay, that's where all of it stems from. All right, from there, I want to go over a few things for you. Write it down quickly because I'm not, I'm going to do it like Bishop do with the seven heads. I'm going to just run through it. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, wait till next year. All right, so get ready. Neo Babylon referred to Diana as Semiramis. Semiramis. All right. The Sumerians referred to her as Inanna, I N A N N A. The Egyptians referred to her as Isis. The, us, we refer to her as Ashtoreth. Assyria referred to her as Ishtar. Babylon referred to her as the Queen of Heaven. Greece referred to her as Venus, Aphrodite, and Hera. Rome referred to her as Juno, Venus, and Easter. The Ephesians, Diana, America, Easter. Okay. So read the verse again. Verse 27. Come on. So that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world Worship it. All right. So let's get a few precepts. Go to Judges 2.13. Excuse me. Judges chapter 2, verse 13, real quick. All right. This is what um this is what we refer to her as. The book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 13. Come on. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And who? Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth. Is that it on that? Yes, sir. All right. From there, go to 1 Kings 11 and 5. All right, this example is showing our forefather go off into idolatry. This is the equivalent of going to the Christian church. All right, because the Christian church is full of idolatry, okay? All right, read this. The book of 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 5. Uh-huh. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. The goddess of who? Of the Zidonians. Come on. And after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Mm -hmm. That's it on that? That's it. All right. I want to go to 2 Maccabees 6. All right. Who remembers what it said in Acts 19? She fell from where? Didn't it say Jupiter? Yes. It did say Jupiter. It did. All right. 2 Maccabees 6 and 1 and 2. Not long after this, the king sent an old man of Athens to compel the Jews to depart from the laws of their fathers Read. and not to live after the laws of God Come on. and to pollute also the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Jupiter and call it what the temple of Jupiter uh-huh Olympias and that in Gazirim of Jupiter 
the defender of strangers. Right. So you have to understand, if they were worshiping Jupiter at that time, who else were they worshiping? You have to understand. You got to think. Huh? Who? Astra, Diana, Venus, whatever. You have to understand the times and the regions where they were. The Romans were in power during the time of Christ and the apostles, okay? So even the region of Ephesus, she still went by the name Venus, which was from Greece, which is an empire that ruled a few hundred years before. She still was called Venus. She was still called Diana. They were interchangeable. But for the most part, in that particular spot, Ephesus, that's what she was known by, okay? I want you to understand the names are interchangeable, okay? And her folklore or her story is the same Throughout all tradition, throughout Egypt, her name was Isis. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, let me do a rundown. Write these down, too. Speaking of names, watch this. All right, so the folk folklore, I'll, I'll just give you a quick summary. Um, Nimrod, when you read Genesis, the 10th chapter, Ceramuses, which is a star, a star tail, a Venus, whatever, that was his wife. All right, the folklore is that he died, okay, and Tammuz was his incarnation, okay? He was not only her son, but it was also Nimrod's spirit through him. So she married her own son, okay? They also derived this from the quote-unquote Holy Trinity. That's where they get it from, the father, the son. And she was that dove. She's the quote-unquote Holy Spirit. That's where all of it comes from. She's the queen of heaven. That's why you see the Catholics. Actually, I'll touch that later. I'm not going to go there yet, but let's talk about these names real quick. Number one, write this down. Jupiter is also known as Zeus, Thor, and Nimrod. Okay, all the same person. Jupiter, Zeus, Thor, Nimrod. Their folklore or their tale may be slightly different, but they're the same person. Okay? All right, so now we're going to go into the three of them uh, throughout different time periods. Um, you have Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz. Okay. In Egypt, you had Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Okay. Um, the folklore's changed slightly. Uh, like we read in Acts 19, you had Jupiter and Diana. Okay. Um, this one, you had Ishtar, which is Venus, and Demuzit. Demuzit served as Tammuz and Nimrod, same person. And then in Greece, you had Aphrodite, which is Venus again, and Adonis. Ever, everybody, anybody ever heard that, the term Adonis? They use that to this day. I, Jake say he's like a black Adonis. We don't realize what, what the hell we're saying right there. All right, that's Tom Oos. Give me that in Ezekiel 8. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 12. Come on. Then said he unto me, son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark. Come on. Every man in the chamber of his imagery. For they say, the Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Come on. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat woman, Weeping for Tammuz. It said women what? Woman weeping for Tammuz. Women were weeping for Tammuz. All right. You see that in the Christian church because all of that so-called trinity derives from this right here. What we're reading. They're doing the same thing. All right. Understand Easter Sunday has nothing to do with Christ's resurrection. It has to do with Tammuz, Tammuz's incarnation of Nimrod. That's what it's about. All right, do a little bit of reading. I want you all to listen closely. It says, the Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. Where can we read about uh, pagan Egypt? What did they used to use as the symbol for Christmas in pagan Egypt? Palm tree. Very good, a palm tree. All right, I'm going to read on. So it says, the Christmas tree, now so common among us, was equally common in pagan Rome and pagan Egypt. In Egypt, the tree was the palm tree. In Rome, it was the fir, the palm tree denoting the pagan Messiah, Baal Tamar, the fir referring to him as Baal Barith, the mother of Adonis. Who's the mother of Adonis? Who is it? Just say it. Who? 
Yes. Yes, all in the same. Anything's acceptable. I just want to make sure you understand. All right. The mother of Adonis, the sun god and great mediatorial divinity was mystical, said to have been changed into a tree. Okay. That was the folklore of Nimrod. Okay. Or the sun god. All right. And when in that state to have brought forth her divine son, if the mother was a tree, the son must have been recognized as the man branch. And this entirely accounts for the putting of the Yule log into the fire on Christmas Eve and the appearance of the Christmas tree the next morning. So the folklore or the tradition, they put the Yule log in the fire. OK, Christmas Eve, that represented Nimrod. And then the next morning, you put up the Christmas tree, which represented Tammuz. Okay? All right. And this entirely accounts for the putting of the Yule log into the fire of Christmas Eve and the appearance of the Christmas tree the next morning. As Zero Adha, the seed of the woman, which name also signified Ignea, or born of the fire. He has to enter the fire on Mother Night that he may be born the next day out of it as the branch of God or the tree that brings all divine gifts to man. But why, it may be asked, does he enter the fire under the symbol of a log? To understand this, it must be remembered that the divine child at the winter solstice was born as a new incarnation of the great God on purpose to revenge his death upon his murderers now the great god cut off in the midst of his power and glory was symbolized symbolized as a huge tree stripped of all of its branches and cut down almost to the ground but the great serpent the symbol of life restoring twist itself around the dead stalk that dead stalk was nimrod and lo at its side up sprouts a young tree a tree of an entirely different kind that is destined never to be cut down by hostile power, even the palm tree, the well-known symbol of victory. All right. So where did we leave off? We read a scripture. Reaping for Tammuz, right? Okay. So not only were they weeping for Tammuz, they were still doing what it said in Acts 19.27. The whole world was worshiping Diana. The whole world. We're going to show you. Go to Jeremiah 7. 18 jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18 the book of jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18 come on the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the woman knead their dough to make cakes to, to do what to make cakes come on to the queen of heaven to make cakes to the queen of heaven all right watch this this is page 93 it says, why thus long before the fourth century and long before the Christian era itself, a festival was celebrated among the heathen at that precise time of the year in honor of the birth of the son of the Babylonian queen of heaven. All right. The Babylonian queen of heaven is the same. Who? Who is that? Right. And her son is named who? All right. Bring another one out real quick. Read that verse again. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. Uh-huh. The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough. The women knead their dough. Knead their dough. So I'm going to go to page 108. It says they knead their dough. Why would they do that? I'm going to start here. All right, this is page 107. It says, the hot cross buns of Good Friday. So in the Catholic Church, they still do this to this day. All right. The hot cross buns of Good Friday and the dyed eggs of Pash or Easter Sunday figured in the Chaldean rites. Who knows who the Chaldeans are? Who has the precept? Tell me who the Chaldeans are first. Go ahead, Simon. Microphone, please. Oh, the uh, ancient Babylonians. All right. Ezra 5 and 12. Go there real quick. Write this down. Write this down. The book of Ezra, chapter 5, verse 12. Come on. But after that, our fathers have provoked the God of heaven unto wrath. He gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, 
The king of Babylon. The king of who? The king of Babylon. Who? The Chaldean. The Chaldean. So who are the Chaldeans, brothers? The Babylonians. Very good. So back to page 107 in the two Babylons. It says, the hot cross buns of Good Friday and the dyed eggs of Pash or Easter Sunday figured in the Chaldean rite. So they were doing this since when? Since Babylon. All right. It says, just as they do now. So the same way they do this, the Easter egg hunt, all that stuff, like, they're doing the same thing back then. Okay? It says, the buns known to by the that identical name were used in the worship of the queen of heaven, the goddess Easter. Read Jeremiah 7 and 18 again. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18. Come on. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire. And the woman need their dough. They do what? Need their dough. For what? Why would they need their dough? Um, They was making cakes to the queen of heaven. Right. That's what they're doing. That's what they were doing. Read. Read, it. Read on. And the woman need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Come on. And to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Right. So just like we're doing today, our forefathers are doing the same thing. Now. Two Babylons, page 105, okay? And I'm going to start at the bottom of the paragraph. It says, among the pagans, this Lent seems to have been an indispensable preliminary to the great annual festival in commemoration of the death and resurrection of Tammuz. That's, that's symbolizing Easter, the death and resurrection. Then they had tried to adopt it with what? the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But that's not what it's talking about. All right, it says, which was celebrated by alternate weeping and rejoicing. Where did we read that at? No. Where did we read that at? Hmm? Ezekiel 8, yes, and 14. That's very good. Ezekiel 8, 14. It says, by alternate weeping and rejoicing. So it's showing you what? They were celebrating Easter back then in the time of Babylon. I'm going to keep saying it just so you understand. All right. It says, and which in many countries, remember what it said in Acts 19, 27, in Asia and all the world, all right, was considerably later than the Christian festival being observed in Palestine and Assyria in June, therefore called the month of Tammuz, and Egypt about the middle of May, and in Britain sometime in April. So it's showing you different Countries kept that feast in different times. In America, when do they keep it? Which month? Which month? April. 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 All right. To conciliate the pagans to nominal Christianity. Rome pursuing its usual policy to measures to get the Christians and pagan festivals amalgamated. Amalgamated means what? Fused or brought together. So the Rome's policy, they did what? took the festivals of the pagans and the high holy days of the Bible and did what? Merged them together. Give me that in Maccabees, the eighth, cha the eighth chapter. First Maccabees 8, 1. The book of First Maccabees, chapter 8, verse 1. Come on. Now Judas had heard of the fame of the Romans, that they were mighty and valiant men, and such as would lovingly accept all that joined themselves unto them. Read. And make a league of amity with all that came unto them. Come on. And that they were men of great valor. And it was told him also of their wars and noble acts, which they had done among the Galatians, and how they had conquered them and brought them under tribute, and what they had done in the country of Spain for the winnings of the of the mines of the silver and gold which is there what verse is that verse three all right so it's going into how rome went to where every land it started conquering them okay read verse four come on and that by their policy by their what by their policy by their what by their policy now it says in this book it says to conciliate the pagans to nominal christianity rome pursuing its usual policy took measures to get the Christian and pagan festivals amalgamated. Read that again. Verse 4. Verse 4. And that by their policy and patience, 
They had conquered all the place, though it were very far from them. What verse are you in? Verse 4. Verse 4, come on. Though it were very far from them. Uh huh. And the kings also that came against them from the uttermost part of the earth. You see that? This is how these different uh, deities or these different festivals were spread. It went from one empire to the next, one empire to the next, okay? Uh, from there, give me Acts 12. Give me Acts 12. The book of Acts, chapter 12, verse 1. Come on. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Uh-huh. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. You see how wicked that is? He killed one of the sons of thunder. All right. He killed James. And our people was like, yeah, keep it going. Because why? Our people were busy celebrating Easter. They were busy celebrating uh, Jupiter, worshiping Zoop, Jupiter and all these other false gods. All right. Read that part again. Verse three. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, Come on. he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. So it says at this time, around this time was the days of unleavened bread, which is called the, the Passover, right? Read on. Acts chapter 12, verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartarians of soldiers to keep him intending after easter to bring him forth to the people all right so my question to y'all is somebody needs to explain how easter got into the bible okay so i need let me let me hear from you first how did easter sneak its way into the bible it was something that we read in the book which should basically tell you go ahead well when they put their policies in place um when they put their policies in place they mingled it together. They they ended up merging it together. And uh, it says in um, chapter 12 and 3, that was the days of unliving bread. So during that time of the... Easter was going on at the same time. That's, 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 that's how you say it, right there. Easter was going on at the same time. So in our kingdom, you had people celebrating what? God's high holy days? But you had who was ruling over Israel at that time? The Romans were ruling. So what did Rome do? They brought in those same policies in where? To Jerusalem. Yes, sir. All right. So the way he said it was correct. So Feast of Eleven Bread is still Feast of Eleven Bread. But Easter was now in the mix as well. So you had some. Remember, the ones who were cheering James' death, they were celebrating Easter. Okay. Yes. I see it. All right. All right. Cool. 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 All right. Now, reverse one again. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king. Who? Herod the king. All right, so I'm going to read about Herod really quick. Just a quick definition. Zon event, Illustrated Bible Dictionary. It says, Herod followed a policy. So we understand what policy he followed. The same policy that we just read about, okay? It says, Herod followed a policy of Hellenization. Who knows what it means to be Hellenized? Y'all should know. We go over this all, like a lot. Uh, let me hear James. Uh, it's in the Zondervan. It describes it as Greeks or uh, Israelites who made Greek their tongue or something like that. Uh, give me more. Um, we took on the customs of the of the Greeks. So that's that's the, yes, yeah. that's good because that's why in the New Testament we were referred to as Greeks. Exactly, those are the Hellenized Jews. Very good. All right, so it says. Uh, Herod followed a policy of Hellenization, establishing games at Jerusalem and adorning many of the Hellenistic cities of his domain. At that time, he sought to reconcile the Jews who hated his pro-Roman and Hellenizing policies. And one of those policies was what? These holidays, these false gods. He brought the same thing to Jerusalem and who never forgave him for his Edomite blood. So, you had the real Israelites who still kept the faith, still kept the laws and commandments of the Most High God. But then you had these brothers. Give me Mark 3 and 6. Okay. The ones cheering, cheering on the death of James. All right. The book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 6. And the Pharisees went forth 
and straightway took counsel with the Herodians. With who? With the Herodians. Herodians. All right, the Herodians are now on the scene. You had those men who did what? They was all, they was with the policies of Rome. All right, they were all for the Hellenization of our people. Okay, so they supported that. So you have to understand, our people, not only those who were actually still keeping the laws, because you still had the what? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders. They were doing what? Mistreating the people. All right. They weren't keeping the law. They were um overlooking the weightier matters, but focusing on the little minor things. And then you had the all out wicked that was celebrating what? Easter and all of these other satanic days. I hope everybody follows. Okay. Very good. Um, Let's go to 2 Timothy 4.22. We're almost done. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 22. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 22. Come on. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. This is an amen. Mine does too, but my phone has a little, has something under. He's going to read that. Watch this. The second epistle unto Timotheus ordained the first bishop of the church of the Ephesians was written from Rome when Paul was brought before Nero. Before who? Before Nero. Before Emperor Nero. Who knows who Emperor Nero is? Who knows who that is? He was responsible for beheading Paul. All right. Under C uh, uh, Caesar Nero, he was um, under his reign. That's when Paul was put to death. Okay. All right. So write that down. That's a historical fact. It's good to know. All right. For your studies. Now, I want to read something about Nero out of, um, it's going to tie into the class. The Roman Empire, the Empire of the Edomite. Okay. By William Beeston. All right. Do a little reading really quick. Uh, I'm going to start at page 34 in the bottom paragraph. It says, What too is to become of the brazen wolf and the cottage of Romulus, preserved to the times of Nero? Who is Nero? Who is he? Right. And he's, he's known for what? Beheading Paul. Exactly. If neither wolf nor Romulus were a chief actor in the tale, False relics imply true revelation and owe their value to a confirmed belief. The pretended portions of the cross of Christ and the Santa Casa of Loretto presuppose unwavering faith in a crucified Savior. All right, so they're basically saying, hey, that's all a charade. It's semantics. It's not truly what they're doing. All right, follow. It says, and his virgin mother and derive their existence solely from this creed, no human sagacity, says Nibur, can arrive at a decisive solution of the question. What, after all, can have been the origin of the tradition? So now it's going to tell us where all of these stories, where all of the uh, traditions and festivals come from. Okay. Uh, nevertheless, aided by the tradition of the rabbins, I venture to affirm that we may establish the certainty of Rome's legendary history by this indisputable proof. So it's going to tell us where all of their Greek mythology, where all of their religion, all that stuff comes from. The pedigree of the Roman people, as found in Virgil, Livy, Dionysius, and other writers, is enveloped in as thick, excuse me, is enveloped in as thick a darkness and is a contradict is as contradictory in itself as that which at one time covered and distinguished the genealogy of the Roman Jupiter himself. So now it's going to go into how everything came about, what they say. So this is what it says. It says, chaos, chaos gave birth to Knox. From Knox came all things. The eldest of the gods was Arrhenius. From Arrhenius sprang Kronos, otherwise called Saturn. And as you can see, a lot of these Greek gods, they name what after them? The planets. All right, the planets. What did it say in Acts 19? Venus fell from where? It says she fell from Jupiter. Exactly. Saturn gave being to divers sons, among them Jupiter. And Jupiter or Zeus, so his other name, was the father both of gods and men. Such was the genealogical labyrinth in which the devout Roman was obliged to walk. 
And this is what they live by. This was the religion of the Romans, okay? All right, and it shows you later on that still doing the same thing, but it's under that thick darkness called Christianity, okay? All right, um, such were the polytheistic absurdities he was consent to reverence and adore. He worshiped Saturn, the father of the great Jupiter. He worshiped Jupiter's grandfather, Aronius. All right, I'll stop there. Just showing you the Caesars, the Romans, all of them, that's what they did, and they spread that same stuff to our people. Now watch this. Give me the book of Acts chapter 14. Watch this. Acts chapter 14. Start at verse 1. I want you to read a little bit faster. Acts chapter 14 verse 1. Come on. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. Come on. And so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. All right. So telling you where this was spread at. All right. Same region, same people. Around the same time period. Paul and. What's his name? Neo. What's his name? Nero. Excuse me. Nero lived during the same time period. And it showed you who he worshipped. Okay. Read on. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. And made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. It's the same, same way they do at camp. So our people who are actually listening no longer listen to us. They tone a deaf ear. All right, read on. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace. Read. And granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Read on. But the multitude of the city was divided. You see that? The multitude of the city was divided. And part held with the Jews. And part with the apostles. Come on. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. Uh-huh. They were aware of it. So the apostles, they knew what they were plotting to do. All right. And this is what they did. Come on. They were aware of it and filled unto Lystra. Fled. And fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lacedon Lacedonia. And unto the region that lieth round about. Come on. And there they preached the gospel. All right. So they said, okay, they don't want to hear us. They're trying to put us to death. We're going to run over here and teach the gospel. Read on. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, uh -huh. who never had walked. Read. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. All right, so he believed what the apostles were saying. All right, he had strong faith. Watch this. Said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw that Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacedonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Right, read that part again. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. What gods are they talking about? Talking about Jupiter, Saturn, you understand? The same gods. Because they all worship the same deities during that time. Okay? And today, <laughs> they're doing the same thing. They're just not calling them that. In the Christian church, they think they're worshiping the one true God. They ain't worshiping the one true God. They're worshiping these deities. It's the same divide, but it's under a cloud. It's not out there in the open. Okay? Uh, read that verse again. Verse 11. Come on. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying, The speech of Lycania, the gods, are come down to us in the likeness of men. Uh-huh. And they called Barnabas Jupiter. They called him what? They called Barnabas Jupiter. So it's telling you what gods they believed in. They say, whoa, whoa. If he has the power to heal him, oh, that's one of the gods. He fell from earth. You understand? The butchering of Genesis, the sixth chapter. You know, the fallen angels. Yeah, that's what. That's not what it's talking about. I hope we ain't going into Genesis six. All right, all right. I'm sorry. Just read the verse. I shouldn't even said it. Why am I? What am I saying? Read it again. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city. You see that they had priest. Remember what it said in Second Maccabees the sixth chapter. They were trying to take us from the religion of our fathers. And start doing what? Serving these idols. They had priests, meaning what they sacrificed unto these idols. Okay? Read that verse again. Then the priests of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates. All right, that's it on that. Now, we're going to close out on this scripture right here. 
I pray um, y'all able to glean something from today's class. Remember, it's titled um, The Lord's Passover versus Easter Sunday. Is Easter in the Bible? Yeah, it is. But is it of God? No, it's not. Passover, that's the high holiday that the Most High God commanded us to keep, all right? Give me that in Psalms 124. I want you to start at verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 7. The book of Psalms, chapter 124 and verse 1. Come on. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say. So think about it, Simon. If it hasn't been for the Lord, you could be worshiping white Jesus right now, Simon. How would that make you feel? That would be horrible. That's the worship. that They say that Trinity stuff, that would be the worship of Tom Moves. That's what they're doing right now in the Christian church. Okay, come on. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us. When those Grecians, when those Romans, when these Americans, you understand, when they rose up against us and put us in slavery. Come on. Then they had swallowed us up quick with when their wrath was kindled against us. Free. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. So what's another preset for that water? Or I just say like flood, flood. Let me help you out. Not Ephesians 5 and 26. Flood. If water overwhelms you, that means it's flooding. Who, who has that precept? Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and verse 16. All right, read it. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and verse 16. Come on. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. All right, so what was the flood that the dragon cast out of his mouth? Oh, his uh, doctrines. What scripture you got? You're right. You're right. It's his doctrines. It's his different doctrines. It's his philosophies and traditions. You're right. What scripture you have? Uh, Colossians 2 and 8. Oh, that's a good one. Who, anybody else? Anybody else? Um, James? Uh, Hebrews 13, 9. All right, let's read that. You can read it. And then break it down for us. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 9. Be not carried away, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Very good. Very good. Very good precept. Also write Ephesians 4 and 14 to go with that. Hebrews 13 and 9, Ephesians 14. I'm sorry. 4 and 14. Those are your precepts when it goes into that flood, okay? All right, let's go back to Psalms 124 and 4. Psalms chapter 124 verse 4. Let's read faster. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over over our soul. Yeah, I understand that, right? When we got off them boats, they indoctrinated us. They spread their policy to us. All right, read on. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Come on. Blessed be the Lord who had not given us as a prey to their teeth. All of our people can't say the same thing. Y'all got to realize, this is a little sanctuary in Tallahassee, Florida. Tallahassee, Florida has a population of 200,000 people. Okay? But look how many people are here today. All right? Read. Verse 7. Read verse Our seven. soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. So all praise to the Most High God. We have escaped the traditions, the philosophies, and the ways of men. And we're going to serve the one true God. All right? Keep his Passover.
would sound odd For years I've been walking around saying that I'm a black man I ain't saying that no more, it sounds wrong, man This is Bishop Nathaniel of Israel United in Christ Please subscribe to our YouTube channels Stay up to date with our latest events, music, and classroom lessons. IUIC plans to continue visiting different countries where this gospel has not been preached before. IUIC needs your help in pushing this truth. So join us, subscribe to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and podcasts, and stay up to date with us. For more information, please visit www.israelunite.org.